Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first episode of Essence of Wonder, a new series where we discuss interesting topics with interesting people. Separation is our new reality, and with it comes both the need and the opportunity to create new ways to bring our community together. This online series is our gift to our world newly united by its distance. As geeks, we are passionate about everything from science fiction and fantasy to an endless variety of other geeky topics. On this show, we don't plan to stop there. We are entrepreneurs, we are technologists, and we'll cover real-world topics ranging from literature and, liter literature and movies all the way to leadership, cybersecurity, business, and science. As a famous bibliophile once said, there is time now. And if you like our show, we welcome you to join us again for our upcoming shows on epidemiology, disinformation, and side stories from NASA history. We even have an upcoming episode about the marketing of the original Star Wars because we like to combine fiction with reality. And now, to officially start our first episode, I'm Gadi Evran, and joining me today is my co-host is Karen Castelletti. Hello, Karen, and thank you for joining us. This is Essence of Wonder. On the show tonight, we have an interview with our guest, David Weber, a short fiction reading of Neil Gaiman's We Can Get Them For You Wholesale by my co-host Karen, a reading by David on one of his works, and a discussion on space war fighting with David talking to Joel Presby, Christopher Weave, and Jacob Holo. To start with, I would like to say to all watching that David does have some severe allergies, and as the day has been bright and shiny, these allergies might just make themselves known. So, in which case, David may have to leave us unexpectedly. And while we are sorry, if he sneezes and everything goes dark, fear not! We did anticipate it, and we will do our best to move on to the panel. Born in Cleveland, a long, long time ago, David grew up in rural South Carolina and was a bookworm from childhood. He was blessed with a father who collected autographed copies of every E.E. E. Smith hardcover and also introduced him to Jack Williamson at the very tender, tender age of 10. I wasn't sure what I was reading at 10, but it wasn't that, trust me. Back to the bio, though. He also had a mother who ran her own ad agency and encouraged him to write from the start with the love of history from a very early, early age and as a practitioner of RPGs before the world had even, even heard of something called Dungeons and Dragons. It was inevitable that he would fall into the evil company of other people like him and become a writer of science fiction himself. He sold his first novel to Jim Bain, his enabler at Bain Books, in 1989 and since that time he has perp perpetrated 69 solo and collaborative novels with two more delivered and an unconscionable number of anthologies upon an innocent and unsuspecting public, that's me and you, is perhaps the best, best known for his character, Hannah Arrington, whom he hopes never to meet in a dark alley, given all the bones she has to pick with him. Casual acquaintances should be warned never to press his talk button because they will never get him to shut up again. And with that in mind, here we are pressing that button. David. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello uh, I, you know, you give me a camera, I'm bound to play with it. I mean, you know, it's just the way it is. About. We want to be yeah. easy going here. Well, I do anyway. I'm not sure about Karen. <laughs> so first, if you don't mind, I would really like to ask you about what inspired your portrayal of unicorns in your novels. <laughs> well, you know, there's a song by the Irish. Never mind. Uh, yeah, I just had this vision in my brain. You know, unicorn. There has to be a unicorn in the story, but I couldn't make it work. So, you know, it's it's a pity they didn't make it onto the arc. Fair enough. So, first of all, are you okay? You feeling okay? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm good. Um, it is. Uh, the main problem is that I have. For years and years and years, I never had um, an allergy problem in the spring. And then uh, the year that we were fighting with the INS to bring the girls home, we were at uh, Babies R Us and talc or something in there set me off. I had to leave the store and I was sneezing straight for like 20 minutes. And I do that really hard, pull over to the side of the road and park sneezes, you know. And ever since then, every spring, man, it's like God turns a switch and I just, you know, I get these explosive chain sneezing attacks. And when it's really bad, I get like a, a kind of a dry cough that comes with it. So, of course, you know, everybody's like, you know, one of the symptoms of the coronavirus is a dry cough, David. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm an old friend of this dry cough, you know. It's, um, 
I think I'm I think I'm good. I think I'm good. I can't I would hear. Be here. We're 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 glad and we we wanted it seemed it seemed a good time in in space time to reassure everybody of that on the air. Oh yeah, well okay, yeah. So yes, yeah, so I'm not planning on 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 going over to the emergency room as soon as we're done here. No, it's it's we're good. <laughs> Just to be clear, I do expect people on this show to say at least a few times, sorry I was muted and other conference call kind of call. Yes. So I, I will share also my personal apology. I am a road warrior and that causes me dry coughs nonstop, which is kind of awkward in today's world of no <laughs> of coronavirus. Yes. Yes. Karen, I think you want to say something. For, fortunately I don't I don't plan to do any coughing during the show, but um <laughs> It does bring us uh, sort of nicely to to David. I'd love to hear how the you know recent month or two have changed your you know your process, how you you know how you write, uh, when and where. It has a, okay. The the biggest problem has been okay. You know that a couple of years ago at Dragon Con, um, I face planted into a cement floor, literally. Uh, uh, several stitches inside my mouth, broke my nose, gave myself a fairly severe concussion. And it took me well over a year to really start putting that in the rearview mirror. For about six, seven months, I couldn't write at all. And then it was, I, for a while there, I wondered if I would ever write again. I mean, it was that hard to, to focus. Um, I'm sort of back into the groove uh, now. Um, and every time I seem to really be starting to move along, something small happens like a coronavirus or, or whatever. Um, in terms of my personal schedule, I always worked out of the house, out of my lonely writer's garret here, you know, so that, that wasn't a big factor. But we have two 18-year-olds and a 17-year-old who are in house lockdown uh, right now. Their school year, the girls' senior soccer season is gone, you know, the whole nine yards. I hate it for their senior year that this is happening. I'm not happy that it's happening to the world at all, you understand. But for us, the fact that they, they really were looking forward to it, they're the co-captains of the team, you know, but... Uh, the whole nine yards that that hurt but uh, the main thing is that there's more in some ways it's a good thing there's more family time there's more bonding time in other ways it's kind of a bad thing because we're in each other's pocket the whole time fortunately I had the pool opened like uh, three weeks early this year. So that helps. Uh, and you, you know, you get out there in the chlorinated water and you say, die virus, die. <laughs> you know? uh, but it hasn't really, the coronavirus specifically hasn't really affected my work process all that much, except for the fact that uh, normally I would, everybody goes to bed and then I come out and work until like three in the morning or whatever. Um, and I can't do that with with them home and my need to spend time with them um I'm, I'm working primarily right this minute on uh, collaborative projects so it's not quite as bad uh except for the fact that i'm a year behind in delivering my next safe hold novel and i haven't even started it yet um nobody has threatened to send any pikas after me to to collect scalps but that's that's the project that bothers me the most the solo project that bothers me the most and it just got nailed by the whole uh concussion thing i just it was that was the scariest thing that's happened to me uh since i became a writer was that total inability to focus to to keep my attention on on what I was doing and every every few weeks I'd say boy I'm a whole man I'm a couple of weeks ago I was I'm glad I'm over that now and then two weeks later I'd realize you know what two weeks ago I wasn't over it it just was so much better than it had been two weeks before that you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. um that was scary for me that, that sounds like it. Um, we, we had had, I'm, I'm going to pull in one of the threads in there. Um, we had had a question in the Q and a, which, which we'll get to some of those later about what your, um, writing process and habits look like. And I, mm -hmm. I, I have the sense you may be a nocturnal writer, a nocturnal creature of a writer, but if you, if you could tell us more about that, I think we'd, we'd love to know where these worlds are dreamed up and what, what that looks like. Yeah. Well, I, okay. 
Um, I got into the habit of working primarily at night because that was when you would have the blocks of time that no one would be disturbing you. You didn't have to be doing anything else. I mean, you know, if you start writing at 9 p.m., you're pretty much past people are going to be dropping by, you know, it's kind of. Um, and so that was my total writing schedule for a long time. Um, I tried uh, a, a year and a half before I gave myself the concussion. Um, I was graying out sitting in my chair working. I thought I was dozing off and we figured out later what was happening was I was waking up. Um, and we did all kinds of neurological tests and everything else. And then finally somebody said, well, let's look at the record on his CPAP machine. And my neurologist looked at me and said, so you've been getting three hours of sleep a night for the last seven months. And I said, three hours seems like enough to me. And he said, no, he said, he said, you're not 30 anymore. And I said, okay. He said, you're not 40 anymore. And I said, okay. He said, you're not 50 anymore. I'm like, okay. And then he went, he went one line too far. He said, hell, you're not even 60 anymore, Dave. And I'm like, okay, okay. That is, that is enough. That's enough. So he said, I want you to get out of the damn office for a month and stay there. And I said, I can't do that. I got this. And then he said, I want you to get out of the damn office for a month and stay there. And I said, but I got this. He said, am I not making myself clear here? And Sharon, who is sitting in the examining room, says, oh, yeah, you're making yourself perfectly clear. Okay. So I had just really had to deal with that. And one of the things that I had done in trying to deal with it was I had said, okay, I'm going to work like more regular hours. I'm not going to binge right anymore. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to work during the day. You know, it'll, it'll be great. Okay. And I was just sort of getting that working when I found the floor in Atlanta. Okay. And then it was like, okay, I don't care when you want to write. You're not going to be able to, you know? Um, so I'm not sure <laughs> what my best writing time is anymore. It's kind of like whenever I can get over there and the phone doesn't ring and they don't drop any bombs, you know. Um, I'm not. I'm not like Louis Lemoore once said that he could write on his lap on the corner of Fifth Avenue when he was when he was writing. It was it was fine with him. Whatever was happening. Um, I'm one of those people who, when I write, I'm really locked in on what I'm doing. I'm really focused on it. I think that's one of the reasons why the whole concussion thing bothered me so much, because I couldn't find that, that lock, okay? And, and when I'm writing, I'm not paying any attention to how much time is passing or anything else. I'm just, it's just coming. Um, and I usually write, uh, I usually write in chapters, um, and the, the, my chapters normally run five to, you know, uh, whatever, um, thousand words on, on a good day, I'll be hitting seven to 9,000 words. Okay. On a, on a regular day, I'll be hitting about four. And when I'm just starting a project, I'll be doing maybe 12, 1300 words while I kind of feel my way into where I'm going. There have been occasions where it almost went the other way, where the first chapter just came like, boom, there it was. And then you had to say, okay, now exactly how do I hook this into the rest of the story that, that I want to tell? Um, and then there was uh, path of the fury. Um, I wrote that entire novel in three weeks. Um, and I've never had that experience before or since. I mean, it just, it was just, there it was, you know? Um, so I would say that, I would say that in some ways I am less of a creature of habit than many writers, but in other ways I'm even more of one. Okay. Because it's when the process is working, I'm very much a creature of habit there. Okay. Once I'm actually sitting down and working, but the, 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 like I have to be out there at eight o'clock in the morning. I have to make my cup of coffee. It has to be ready by nine. I, I know people who are scheduled that way and that's what they use to pull themselves through the writing process. Okay. Uh, back many years ago when I smoked a pipe, I would play with the pipe while I was writing. 
And uh, I put it down uh, next best thing to 30 years ago now and just never, never smoked again. But I had to go and buy another pipe so that I could play with it while I wrote for about three months before I could break myself of the mannerisms that were part of the writing process. What do I do when I'm thinking about this? Well, I take this pipe, I tamp it down, you know, I run a pipe cleaner through it. I read, you know, and I was like, all of a sudden I didn't have anything to do with my hands. Sharon said that if my arms were ever amputated, I could never talk to anyone again. And I said, nonsense, dear. That's why I have voice recognition software, you know, kind of thing. She said, but, but you would just sit there and look at the screen because you couldn't wave your hands around. And I'm like, nonsense then she made me watch a video of an interview and i was like my god <laughs> she's right um that wandered well i i had one the the path of the fury in three weeks was a, a particularly um surprising and impressive anecdote um it, it makes me wonder, are you know, you've heard of the, the plotters versus the pantsers or many other analogies. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what is your, your structure of coming up with the, the plot? Do you follow a character's voice? Um, uh, okay, for me... Please, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm a little bit of the all of the above. There's a lot more as you get deeper and deeper into a series, you have to go more and more of the I have to plot this out uh, motif. That's that's more true for, say, the Honorverse, where I have a war going and the fronts may be two, three weeks travel time apart. And that's the only way you can get a message from from one fleet to another there. It's more of a case of having to set up a very detailed timeline for movements. I'll be working and I'll have my timeline open on the, on the other screen over here and I'll make a note on it, you know, okay, this is when the courier ship leaves Manticore and then I'll go down and I'll say, and this is when it arrives where it's going. And then I fill the timeline in with what I'm working and I say, Oh, Oh, the courier ship just got here <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Um, that is a, a form of plotting rather than flying by the seat of your pants. But it also partakes, if you see what I'm saying, of the, of the sort of, I don't know where this is going, let's find out, uh, school of thought. Now, I do um, have, I, I have, before I begin a series or, or a novel, I have a spinal column in mind for it. But I have, I don't make any great effort to plot out in detail how I'm going to do each cell along, along the way until I actually get into the book. There are instances, and this is especially true when you're doing collaboratives, where you have to do that because your collaborator can't deal with your surprises. You know, you can, but, but, but your collaborator needs to know what's going on. Uh, especially because I write this minute, I'm doing a lot of collaborative work. Um, part of that, I was doing that even before uh, the, the, the fell adventure of Atlanta. Um, but I've been doing a little more, I've been taking more of that on because of the problems that I was having and staying focused. I could do a chapter at a time and that would, and it would be good but staying focused for more than that was the problem. Uh, so like uh, Chris Kennedy and I did um, Into the Light, which is the sequel to Out of the Dark. And I wrote the opening chapter to kind of set the tone for the novel. And I have absolutely no memory of writing that chapter. Uh, the first time that I read it aloud at a uh, science fiction convention was the first time that I'd seen it when I wasn't editing with the keyboard, which is what I do after I use the voice recognition to, to write it. And so I'm reading this chapter aloud and my voice kept cracking because of the terrible things I was doing to the people in this chapter. And I was like, oh my God, I, it works. It works. It's making me want to cry, you know. Um, but I, I don't remember writing the chapter at all. But in a project like that, you have to be sort of on sync. You have, you, you, you have to have at least a general notion for the novel and then, especially if you're doing chapters that are going back and forth, like I'm doing a scene and then Chris is doing a scene that happens sequentially after it with a different set of characters. Okay. 
we have to know how those two scenes are going to tie together temporally and in terms of, of the action in them. So in those instances, you have to have um, a plot outline or a chapter summary to work from, chapter synopsis to work from or whatever. Um, I, for myself, when I'm writing solo, it's better for me to just know, okay, this is what this chapter has to do not how am I going to do it in this chapter until I get into it, if that makes, if that makes sense. And sometimes you find yourself, Honor Harrington was supposed to die um, in the book that became um, At All Costs, the one that Alistair McKeon dies in. Uh, their roles got reversed. Um, I won't pretend that I was heartbroken about that, but I'd originally projected the entire series to only go maybe six books. That was, you know, off a little, yeah. Um, but uh, I was doing a collaboration with Eric Flint. Um, actually, he did a short. He did a short story, and he wanted to know if there was an issue that uh, a Manticorn secret agent and a Havenite secret agent could agree on. And I said, sure, well, you know, genetic slavery. There's manpower and all this. this. I said, okay, fine. And then I realized that I had pulled the storyline forward almost twenty years by introducing that element at that time in that story. And by the time I realized, realized that we'd already done Crown of Slaves, which was his first collaborative novel with me in the Honorverse, and all of a sudden I didn't have time to kill Honor and let her kids grow up to, to handle this problem, which is what was supposed to happen in my original, for those of you who are E.E. E. Smith fans, my original visualization of the cosmic all, that was how it was supposed to work. So instead... Like I say, I couldn't kill her. But if any of you thought that there was a little bit of a, uh, um, in, in, what I had to do was I had to figure out how to get to the conclusion I always had in mind for that second story arc without launching the second story arc. Okay, the Solarian League was supposed to have another 20 years to figure out that its technology sucked wind so that it would have been like a real fight when two of their when two Manticoran destroyers ran into a, a Solarian battlecruiser. <laughs> okay, instead of a, okay, the Solarians are toast. Um, and so I had to do some other stuff in there to make everything work out uh, where it worked out. And um, the um, shadow of, um, Shadow of Freedom um, was a book that I wrote in the middle of that um, three hours of sleep a night. One reason I was getting three hours of sleep a night was that I had a seven week window to do the final edits, production edits on uh, Shadow of Freedom and through Fiery Trials in the Safe Hold books. And they were sending me pages as they were produced for me to read electronically and get back to them. And so I was, you know, pushing on both those projects at once, which is what pushed me over the edge, I think, into the actual conk, uh, kind of thing. Um, but uh, the, 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 I like Shadow of Freedom. But if I had it to do over again, um, I have a planet that was settled by ethnic Czechs and one that was settled by ethnic Poles, okay? And so I, all their institutions are named in Czech and in Polish. Well, that's fine if you're a Czech speaker, you know that's, that's Polish over there because I can't read it, <laughs> you know, whatever. If you're an English speaker, it's like, wait, it's the foreigners again. So what I really needed to do was maybe create the institutions in the native language of the, of the folks living there, uh, but then use uh, English translation for it when I mentioned it in text. That, I think, is the one thing that I would change if I got to go back to the book. And I had a lot of people who were like, why is he spending all this time with Dermy and Hara Hop, you know, kind of thing. And if you've read Uncompromising Honor, you know why I was spending all that time with Dermy and Hara Hop, because he has become one of the central characters uh, going forward. And besides, I liked him and it was my book, you know. Well, I will say, first of all, that going back about 10 minutes, you're a horrible person for being a morning person. That's just my personal take on the situation. Everything's <clears throat> fine. Yeah. 
But we do have some questions coming in. Yes. So let's try and move through some of them. First one from Imri Goldberg is, does David have a favorite animal that is not a tree cat? You mean, do I know a favorite animal or is there a favorite species? Um, I, um, I have a real weakness for golden retrievers. Um, but um, I think my experience as somebody who interacts with animals um, is that if you treat any animal uh, with, uh, with dignity, um, and, and affection, um, they respond, uh, in, in kind. Uh, I've had rabbits, uh, I've had, no, okay. Now I, I did, I did once have a white rat and he was not, a he was not, you know, he didn't care. It was just, you know, that was his world, you know? Um, but nah, yeah, not really. <laughs> Fair enough. So another one here. Um, let me see, let me see. Joseph Reacher, I hope I'm reading this right. Hmm? What's the last great book you have read? Oh my goodness. Um, well, interestingly enough, uh, about uh, three months ago, I was just rereading John Barry's uh, book on the 1918 uh, flu epidemic. And you can see what happens when I read something like that. You know, you can blame it all on me. I read it. It's, it was bound to happen. Um, Mm. Uh, last great book there. I read primarily these days when I'm not um, when I'm not working. These days I'm reading a lot more. Um, I've always read a lot of nonfiction, and that's what I'm reading primarily these days. Um, histories and that sort of thing. Um, right this minute, I'm uh, working my way back through um, history of Western civilization in like nine volumes, which is great. But yeah. Um, I think that what I am eagerly waiting for right this minute uh, are, are two books. Uh, well, okay, there are three. Uh, I want uh, the sequel to Jim Butcher's uh, The Aeronaut's Windless. Yes. Um, and oh, things we I, want from Jim Butcher. Yes, yes. And I want the uh, Larry Correa's uh, third uh, Black Sword novel because I'm really following that. Um, and anything that I can get my hands on in the Liadin universe. Um, if, and if you haven't read that, you, you, you really need to. Uh, Bain has those now, which has nothing to do with why you should read them, you know. Um, but uh, they are, they're great. Um, and what else? That's really, in terms of science fiction and fantasy, that's really what I'm reading uh, uh, right now. I mean, I pick up a lot of stuff and, 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 and go through it and say, boy, that was pretty good, and then move on to the next thing, okay? But those are the ones that I'm really, really waiting for uh, right now. Fair enough. So here is a surprise question from the history of Reddit. If you could, I know you're a student of military history. Mm. If, um, Marine battalion went back in time to the Roman Empire. What would happen? And who would win? Well, uh, the big problem would be ammunition resupply. Once, once the ammo ran out, the Marines could be in a lot of trouble. But on the other hand, uh, assuming that they took what would be a standard unit of fire for a modern day battle with them, uh, they could, they could mop up a lot of Russia, Roman legions, uh, you know, really quick. Uh, you know, I, um, a surprise question. How would you adapt tactics to the Roman empire to be able to counter this new threat? Oh, if I were the Roman empire, how would I adapt? Uh, I'd treat them pretty much like I treated Hannibal. Uh, which is to stay away from them, make them, if, especially if I could figure out that they needed fuel for their vehicles, okay? Because if you think about it, they've got high mobility, but only a little bit of it, because once the tanks are dry, the tanks are dry, all right? So I would, my, my thing would be, uh, to quote, uh, to quote uh, 
King Arthur from Monty Python and would be like, run away um, and, and make them come and catch me. Um, and then once you've got them on foot, like you, you've got the entire infrastructure of your empire behind you and they don't. So, you know, it dep- you know, it, there's a difference between their ability to destroy your empire, which they could, you know, if they just went to Rome, I mean, they could pretty much do that. Um, and they're being able to take over your empire. Uh, so I would think that the, the primary weapon of the Roman defenders would be time and distance. Um, and, um, and they did, they would just have to accept that if it came to an actual stand up engagement, rather than a jump out and ambush you with our, uh, our auxiliary javelin throwers and then run away, that they were going to get their clocks cleaned, uh, unless they had just hugely overwhelming numbers and were prepared to accept that kind of casualties. One thing that a lot of people don't realize when they're talking about something like the Roman empire is that the limiting factor is manpower because we 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 live in a planet that has seven well on a planet that has seven billion people on it okay rome was able to conquer the mediterranean because they had an excess 70,000 or so of population every year that they could keep in a standing army partly because of their slave economy and everything else um but we are used to a society in which you have scores of people supporting every person in uniform. Um, And the Romans don't have scores of people they can put out there to support everyone in uniform. And they also can't absorb the kind of casualties that a modern army could absorb because they will run out of bodies to replace them. Do you see what I'm saying? That's one of the reasons why when you read about the Mongol hordes and they tell you that so-and-so had 150,000 troops, you go, "Uh uh-huh. And where did those 150,000 troops come from? And what did all those horses eat? And they go, well, I don't know, man, but they had, because it said right here in in this chronicle by the guys who got their butts kicked by the Mongols that there were 150,000 of them. (laughs) Like, yeah, well, if I got my butts kicked by them, I wouldn't say, yeah, there were only 12. (laughs) Uh, but that, that's a, a, a factor that people who, who write military fiction but don't know military history lose track of. Um, the limiting factor of animal-drawn logistics, uh, the limiting factor of uh, we don't have mass production. To, what made World War I so incredibly bloody was that no one had ever before fought an industrialized war. Um, and nobody realized how, te- well, it also didn't help that you had a 700 mile siege line from Switzerland to the North Sea and nobody had counted on that either. But it was, it was the fact that they had the industrial ability to keep thousands upon thousands of men in the field and keep them supplied almost indefinitely that made World War I such an incredibly bloody uh, affair. And no one could, no one saw it coming because no one had ever experienced it. Um, that's another thing that studying history does for you, whether it's something like the coronavirus today or World War I then, you know, it's very clear looking back over your shoulder what you should have seen, what you should have done, what you should have known. But as a historian, you know that the folks who are actually making those decisions don't have that luxury. They have to make the decision then. I'd, I'd give you one example from World War I. People talk about how unimaginative World War I generals were, and they, you know, just the same old thing over and over again. Think about this. The tank did not exist in August of 1914. The system was developed and deployed by early 1916. So basically, in less than 16 months, they went from a non-existent weapon system to deploying the first examples of what became the dominant weapon system of land warfare. That's not people without an imagination. That's, that's people who are stuck in a situation where, for political reasons, they have to conduct offensives when they can't give their guys the tools to do it with in the changed environment. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, and it's not a bit surprising that people who survived World War I blame the generals 
for what happened. And I'm not saying that there weren't generals who were out of touch with what was going on at the front, but I'm saying that those men were intelligent. They weren't idiots. And they were trying desperately to find the answer. That's why they tried different artillery combinations. So why gas was used, why all this stuff. They're, they're, the horrors that were released were released in part because people were trying to find a way to escape the horror that already existed. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, so, and, and that's how a Marine division would make out against the Roman Empire. This, this reminds me of the, the points that I, I don't even know who to co attribute the quote to, that um, wars are about 90% logistics, though mm. it's, it's not, what you, not what you focus on. But. Well, I, I, always, I usually have somebody say in one of my books, you know, amateur study tactics, professionals study logistics, um, because that's what lets the professionals beat the crap out of talented amateurs. Okay. Um, and it, it's true. And it, it's, it's also, of course, it's a vast oversimplification. I, I personally like von Clausewitz. He said, uh, and this is a paraphrase guys can't remember the exact quote, which was in German anyway. You know? Uh, but, uh, he said uh, in war, everything is very simple, but accomplishing even very simple things is incredibly difficult. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's another reason why your, your staffs and your, your people who study the logistics, the people who study the nuts and bolts of just how do you get the army from point A to point B? You know, how do you make sure the Navy has enough oil operating off the coast of Japan? Those folks are incredibly important, always have been, but especially uh, in a, a uh, war fighting system in which we use machines to break machines. Mm. Uh, which is the Western concept of how you fight a war these days. Um, because you have to keep those machines survived, uh, uh, provided with, the, with spare parts, with bullets, with, you know, whatever. Logistics have always, always, always been the Achilles heel of any military force. I cannot, I don't think anybody could begin to, even guesstimate how many operations, for example, in, uh, in medieval Europe had to be called off because we can no longer feed the troops to keep them in the field. Okay. The battle of Agincourt was fought because the English had to make their way back to the coast because they were all starving to death. And so they're marching along and the French caught them on the move. If the French had said, well, you know what, we're not going to attack. We're just going to sit here and watch you starve. It would have worked that much better for them. Um, as it was, Agincourt became an enormous British victory. Uh, but it was, it was logistics have compelled armies to give battle at the wrong time, uh, just with incredible frequency in history. We have a question from Sean Killian. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And I would just like to read it because I think it's also giving good feedback to you. Okay. Your books are very popular within the Navy and the Coast Guard communities, with them regularly seen being read by sailors at sea and shore. So thank you for that. And now to the question. My question being, where do you draw from for, uh, for the leadership style and philosophy of Honor Arrington? Ah, okay. The central core of what makes Honor Harrington who she is, there are, I think, two strands that come, come together. Uh, and both of them are very important to me in, in my own life. I don't, I don't do as well as she does uh, in living up to them all the time. But the first one is Honor is a responsibility taker. I think that's one of the things that draws people to her a lot. Um, she's like, she doesn't care who created the problem. What she cares about is whether or not she can fix it or whether or not she can try to fix it. Okay. And so I think, I think people like that in, in the, in, in the character. The other thing is honor has a dark side. She's very good at killing people. Um, and once she decides that that's the solution to the problem, that's what she does. I have a dark side. Um, and for a long time in my 
20s and my, my early 30s, I would go to country bars on Friday nights um, when I wasn't all that fond of the music or anything else because I could count on somebody to get drunk and pick a fight with the big guy. And that was why I was going. I was working through some, some issues. What I think I finally figured out how to do and what honor does is that dark side is subordinated to her compassionate side, to her need to protect those around her, as opposed to her need to just destroy people who piss her off. Okay. Um, and it took me a long time to figure out that a lot of the, the, a lot of the anger issues that I was working through had to do with things that had happened to me earlier in my life and my sense that I had been unable to protect some people that I cared from, cared for. Um, and I, I literally looking back, you know, being fair to myself, I literally had been unable to, I wasn't big enough. I wasn't strong enough. I was just, you know, it was my job to get between them and the problem and take the beaten. Uh, and that was all I could do at that point. And that, that leaves a mark. Uh, so I think that, I think that those two parts of her personality are informed through my, my personal life uh, experience to help me decide who I wish I could have been in, in those regards. And I think people look at honor and that it strikes a chord. This is the kind of leader they would like to follow. This is the kind of code they would like to have. And the other thing about honor is that despite Nimitz, she is damaged uh, in, in, in many ways. And she has to deal with that. She has to work through it. Uh, but she works through it. She's not a victim of her damage. Okay, the damage may be the result of somebody who victimized her at an earlier point in her life, but she refuses to just say, well, I didn't do it. I can't help it. I can't deal with this. Okay. Um, I think that's something else that, that uh, people are, are attracted to in her. Um, honor is... Um, Honor is the person who makes the hard call. And she's a person who, one of, one of my dear friends, um, we've lost him several, oh gosh, over a decade ago now and in a small plane accident. But he was uh, Colonel Mack, Maxwell McGregor McMahon. <laughs> So you can guess why people call him Colonel Mack. You know. um, but he was drafted for the Korean War um, and discovered that he liked the military, uh, served through Desert Storm, uh, was in the Special Forces community, you know, et cetera. And he told me one time, he said, you know, you know what the second worst moment in a combat commander's life is? And I said, no. And he said, okay, the second worst moment in a combat commander's life, the intelligence was good. The planning was good. The, the, the rehearsals were good. Everybody executed perfectly, and you accomplished all your mission objectives. And a 19-year-old is bleeding out in your arms, and you can't put the life back into him no matter what you do. And I said, that's the second worst moment. He said, yep. I said, what's the worst? He said, when you realize this is what you do best in all the world. Okay? And that's honor. There's a lot of Colonel Mack in honor. Uh, she carries the memory of every single person who's died, whether she knew that person or not. She carries the knowledge of all those deaths on either side with her, and she would love to stop. But she knows that she does it better than other people. And if she steps back, somebody else will have to do it, and they won't do it as well as she will. And more people will die than have to. Okay. And I think that's something that is very central to her character and that also draws people to her. But I think as far as the folks in the military who are, are drawn to her, I think, I think a lot of it goes back to the very first book to on Basilisk station. And particularly when she tells, I think it's McKeon when he says, you know, nobody has, 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 tried to do all this crap you're doing and it's pissing everybody off. And she says, whether or not other people have done their duty has no bearing at all on whether or not it's my job to do mine. 
And I think that that, I think that resonates with a lot of folks um, in the military and outside the military too, but especially in the military. Um, I think that as a culture today, whether you are left or right or whatever, one of the things that you're tired of is the sense that people say, well, so-and-so did such and such, and that justifies me doing thus and so. Okay. It's not supposed to be about, about payback. It's not supposed to be about sort of balancing, you know, my misdeeds balance your misdeeds. It's supposed to be about what am I supposed to be doing and then doing it. And that's, that's what honor's about. Okay. I knew I was going to name her honor from the beginning. Okay. Um, and if the books hadn't gone quite as well as they went, we probably would have hung honor on one of the girls, but I could not do that. You know, no, 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 no. That would have been too much, especially since they're Cambodian, you know, <laughs> like, oh yes, honor Harrington. I see. Uh, but I didn't know what the last name was going to be, but I figured if the books worked, that they would be compared to Horatio Hornblower. So I figured, and I love the Hornblower books. Uh, Honor is nowhere near as neurotic as Hornblower, but anyway. Um, but so I figured I would go ahead and give her HH for the initials. And I can't tell you where Harrington came from. It just seemed to, to go well, you know. Um, so, so that's how she came to be named Honor Harrington. I, I just want to say that I think we, we saw a lot of wows in the comments. Um, thank you for sharing that story about your friend Mac. Um, mm -hmm. I it really got chills and I think I'm not the only one. And it, it strikes me that in many ways, you know, not just resonating with values that already exist, but, you know, people's favorite characters in many ways raise them and inspire them and, you know, instill and mold the morals that we grow up with. And I, think, I think you're right. I have very strong feelings about young adult novels. Very strong feelings. That's one reason why we did the beautiful friendship and whatnot. I hate dystopian fiction at all. And I think it ought to be outlawed for young readers because they're at a point in their lives when the entire world is against them anyway. The last thing they need is a book that confirms that, yeah, the world is a horrible place and can't trust any adults because the ones who aren't evil are stupid. Okay. Um, that's the last thing that uh, 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 a young reader who is trying to find a safe place in their reading or who is, is, is looking for lessons to kind of help them through uh, what they're dealing with needs to go. There's, and you can write novels which can challenge them all day long in which they can identify with that. I go, oh boy, this character's in, a, in the deep kimchi right now and how do we get them out? Without that, that sort of dystopian, you know, there's one that I actually read because somebody made me, um, in which the, the heroine is a cutter and that's her thing, you know. All, and, and at the end of the book, two of her best friends are dead, one from a drug overdose, one from, a, from suicide, and she's still cutting herself. But the, the victory is that she survived. Okay? And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what uh, a, 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 a teenager who's already in a bad place needs to be reading. I think that I probably am not unlike a lot of other readers who was drawn to books when I was young because I was in a situation that later led to all those bar fights, but I was looking for a place where the values my parents were trying to teach me could actually work. Okay. A place, a place that said to me, okay, this is who you pattern yourself on. If you want to be a worthwhile human being and why should you settle for not being a worthwhile human being? All right. Now I know the arguments in favor of you have to write a book that it's going to speak to the actual life experience of the reader. I understand that. I don't know too many people who were actually been starship captains in their life experience. Um, 
I think of science fiction, and those of you who have been to science fiction conventions where I've been on panels have heard me say this before, so you can go get a glass of water or whatever while I say this. Um, I think of science fiction as the, um, a, techni a technological society's fairy tales. Okay, they serve the same functions. They're cautionary tales, they're warning tales, they're inspirational tales, they're interpretive tales, but they do it in terms of, of a technocratic background rather than a pre-industrial background. So instead of, of, of uh, angry demigods and whatnot as the explanation, we have, we have scientists who are fighting over which is the actual correct theory. Uh, and the fate of the universe depends on figuring out which is the right answer. Uh, and we, you know, we have, we have cyborgs instead of trolls, you know, the, 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 the tools change, but the function of the story remains the same. Um, and I think that's one place where we lose, we lose texture. We lose value when we start saying there are some sorts of stories we shouldn't tell. Okay, there's some sort of characters we shouldn't have. There's, you know, um, we, should, we should worry about whether or not we've checked off all the boxes rather than is this the story that we need to tell. And I point out to people that the, the true classics that get read and read and read and read were seldom written as classics in their day. They were the popular entertainment of the day that spoke to a universal human condition in terms that lived. Okay. I don't know anybody who reads Catcher in the Rye unless it's assigned. Okay. But I know a lot of people who read Mark Twain when it wasn't assigned at all. All right. Uh, Shakespeare, yeah, they make you learn it in college, but if you, in, in high school, but if you just, if you just read it as prose instead of trying to read it as poetry with line breaks, my God, that man could write. Um, and that's, that's why he's still with us, whether it was him or Francis Bacon who wrote it, I don't care, you know, um, whoever it was, the man could write. And he understood, he understood what goes on inside human beings. And I'm not sure Holden Caulfield did. Uh, in Catcher in the Rye. Catcher in the Rye is just an alienated kid who's like, you know, sort of drifting around, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's somebody who is so lost in looking at his own navel in the, in the, the, the environment in which he is while he's dealing with his powerlessness and, and everything else. Romeo and Juliet have a much unhappier ending, okay? But you're actually inside human beings who are dealing with stuff. And I think that's why people read. Um, I th people don't read because, oh, they got shiny spaceships in them. People read because, ooh, look, these really good characters have shiny spaceships. All right. And if you can't make your reader care uh, about your characters, even if it's a, I can hardly wait to see Pavel Young get his kind of thing. If you can't get the, the reader to invest in those characters, they're going to read one of your books and then they're going to spend the rest of their time with somebody who can. Um, and that, that's just the way that it is. Um, we talk a lot about plot. We talk a lot about structure, but what it's really all about is voice. It's the way that you tell the story and the way that you handle the characters, that's what attracts readers. And the same voice, the same style, isn't going to attract every reader, okay? And that's, that's just the way that it is, too. But that is what builds a readership. That is what builds a successful story, is the way that you tell the, tell the story. And you have to trust your voice when you tell it. You can't sit there and say, okay, this is a detective novel, so how would Dashiell Hammett write it? Uh, you have to say, okay, this is a detective novel, and I never wrote one before, so how would I tell it? And, and, and do it that way. And a lot of people who could be writers never make it past that hurdle 
of figuring of figuring out that they have to tell the story their way. They keep trying to tell it somebody else's way and then not understanding why it's dead for them. I would like to, first of all, thank you again. I would like to start wrapping up to the hour and move on to the other parts of the show. There are a couple of things I would like to throw out there. Number one, uh, you mentioned children and YA. Mm -hmm. And we know a lot of readers of YA actually aren't children. Um, and that's something I'm not sure we can touch on today, but I was wondering about that. You choose what you want to touch on from these two things. And the second thing is, given that you have kids and you have two adopted kids from Africa, I believe. The, and the, from Cambodia. Cambodia, I apologize. Yep. And you had a third child born at the same time. And you had to t deal with three children growing up. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of... Um, I'll stop there and leave it as an open question, although I'm wrapping it. I actually have one specific thing here. I heard once this philosopher talk about Harry Potter, and he opened up, he never read it before, he opened up uh, the first page of the fifth or sixth book, and I think, I, forgive me for not remembering, and the, on the first page, you have a kid's parents dying. They discuss Harry Potter and his, his, his parents dying, which is scary as whole to a child. Uh, now, I understand, of course, the audience grows, but how do you find the line on what you want to do and how did you direct if any your children in doing that um okay i read uh the harry potters uh to my kids uh up through i think um the half-blood uh prince um and at that point i said okay you guys can can finish these on your own her audience grew with her as as she was writing so the people who started as her target audience when the first book was released were like 19 or whatever by the time the last book was released. So they had an opportunity for their life history to grow right along with it. Kids can handle stuff. And I'm not saying when I say, you know, that I don't like dystopian fiction, you can't throw loss at kids in, 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 a, in a young adult novel that a young, actual young adults are going to read. You just can't throw nothing but bleakness and despair at them to accompany the death, okay? Um, sometimes what you can do is help them find a meaning behind the death. It wasn't just like Tasha Yar being told in that episode of, of, of Enterprise. I, I know it was a pointless death, okay? Um, yeah, but the, the, in terms of the fact that... Um, Adults read young adults. I go back to what Heinlein said when they asked him how he wrote a young adult. Uh, and his response was, well, you write it just like you'd write a novel for adults and leave out all the cussing and sex. Okay. Um, and of course, he was writing in a different era. So, you know, the cussing and stuff, you know, still probably going to be there. But my point is, you don't write down to the kids. You know, your word choices might be a little different, you know, but you don't say like, okay, I got to make this Dr. Seuss. You say, you know what? You're a young, inexperienced reader, but you're just as smart as somebody who's been reading for 30 years. And so I am going, and if you occasionally have to figure out a word from context or you got to go look it up, fine. That's how your vocabulary grows but I'm going to treat you with the respect of expecting you to understand what I'm saying to you. Um, and then it's your job to say it in a way that somebody who's not going to have a chance to ask you for clarification can, can take away what you, what you meant them to have. As far as our kids are concerned, you know, when I was a kid, my parents didn't worry about what I read. Their theory was, okay, if he can understand it, then it's fine. And if he can't, it'll go right past him and I'll worry about it later. But when I was a kid, the available menu was very different from what's available today. I, re <laughs> I remember... <laughs> Oh God! I, I just remembered. Okay, the girls uh, are—they're—they're uh, they're eighteen now, but they were about fourteen, I guess, thirteen, fourteen, um, and uh, they're—they were—they're—they uh, were ordering books off Amazon, and they and they knew that their mom was monitoring their account, and so they came up to her room and they said, "Mom," I said, "Yeah," she's. <laughs> We know you're looking at the books we order. I said, yeah. He said, 
we thought these were just romances, okay? We didn't know that they were hardcore gay porn, so please don't kill us. <laughs> so we didn't mean to order them, <laughs> you know, kind of She says, that's okay, just delete the, <laughs> you know, sort of thing. So, you know, that was not a factor when I was a kid. All right. So my parents didn't worry about that. Although I did get in trouble in the fifth grade for bringing my dad's copy of uh, Daniel Defoe's uh, Roxana or the Fortunate Mistress with the original 16th century woodcuts of naked ladies hopping in and out of beds to school with me in the fifth grade in, Green, in, in Simpsonville, South Carolina. My fifth grade teacher was not really ready for me to be sitting there in the back of the room in what was supposed to be the history lesson, reading this novel with naked ladies in it. And it, it did not go well, uh, including a conversation my father had with the principal. It's, it's called literature, you moron. Maybe you should try reading it. Um, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was not the education system's finest day in South Carolina. And I've wandered again. See, that's what I do when Sharon's not here to poke me. You know, you, you may notice when she sits beside me on a panel, I, some of my conversations end abruptly. It's because she pinches where nobody can see her. All right. Well, we have a final question for you before we move on. You have something, it, it has happened before, don't get me wrong, but it's pretty unique to have a fan club with over six thousand members worldwide um and you know this interview well we met before and i met sharon before was organized by the second space lord cheryl kraus so mm -hmm. i appreciate the royal monte Carlo navy and uh, the fan club and if anybody hasn't heard about me yet go and google it more, more, royal monte Carlo and fan club they're amazing people and very supportive yeah. so the question is for you how the how do you handle them <laughs> they're they're such good people and they're so excited about this all the time they're you know, they them, they they are they are family, even the ones we haven't met yet. Um, I tell people uh, when I'm talking to them that the fact that my books attract people like them is the greatest compliment that anybody could could pay me. Um, and we have an incredible diversity of political views, of social views. Um, I have had the experience of putting something on Facebook and flame wars start almost immediately. And somebody finally explained it to me. They said, Dave, the problem is you attract people from all over the political spectrum. So when you put up a post, you have far left loonies and right wing. I have a picture of Adolf Hitler in my basement people, you know, who, who, who read it because you put it up there. And then they start reading what the other guy said and say, oh, you idiot. How could you possibly, you know, kind of thing. Um, it is, it is sobering and very, very flattering to have that many people invest that much of their lives in a character and in a literary universe that, that, uh, that you created. Um, and the fact that even with the diversity of opinion and views they have, they can find so many positive, life-affirming, supportive things to do and believe in common. Tells me that the polarization that we're looking at in this country is an artificial construct. That, uh, that, that, you know, that if we could just, when Eric Flint and I were writing um, 1635, The Baltic War, um, one of the points that we were bearing in mind the whole time is the most liberal conservative 20th century American and the most conservative imaginable 20th century American have far more in common than either of them would have with the 17th century. Because so much of what they disagree on is coming from the same place, the same basic value structure. And I think that's another thing that attracts people in some ways to the, to the Honor Harrington books, uh, because Honor understands that. Um, and I think people who are tired of battering themselves on other people or seeing this going on 
appreciate the notion that there could be an intelligent human being somewhere in the universe who may have strong views, uh, may choose up sides, but who doesn't anathematize everyone on the other side of, of the divide. Um, and I think that's one of the things you see in, in the fan club. Um, and the other thing you see is they have this sense of family. Sharon, Sharon genuinely does not understand how popular she is in the fan club. She says, oh, yeah, they're only because you blah, blah, blah. It's like nonsense. Okay, honor. She is kind of the din mother <laughs> to the entire TRMN. I mean, you know, it, it works that way. Um, and it has been an incredible honor and incredibly flattering to watch this organization grow. Martin, you've done good. Just thought I'd throw that in. Fair enough. So with that, we want to thank you for the interview. We're sorry you couldn't go through all the questions, but it's always wonderful to hear you speak. And on that note, we're going to move over to Karen, my co-host, who is going to read a story for us. Essentially, what we have done is... Basically, we want to, I'll, I'll do this more officially because I think it's, it, deserves it, it deserves it. With special thanks to Neil Gaiman for making all of his works free to read to the world and LeVar Burden for being the man bold enough to ask where no one has asked before. And to be honest, he shared on Twitter, I'm not sure you have seen it, how much he looked through license free uh, literature to try and find short stories to read and he failed miserably and was impressed by it. And Neil Gaiman just went out and said, hey, you know, just use mine. And then he said, Read, you know, everybody, when somebody else asks, just feel free to use all my work uh, during this hard, uh, these hard times. Yeah. So with that, I, both you and me will close our video and mute, mute ourselves and give it off there to Karen to read yes. it for us. Go, Karen. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye for now. All right, I'd, I'd gotten my choices down to, to two favorites, and it is very difficult to choose between all of the shorts that Neil Gaiman has written. Um, and they, the choices broadly came down to uh, slightly longer and funnier, or shorter and, and a bit darker. Uh, I am going to go with the darker one in the spirit of David reminding us that uh, we shouldn't shy away from our dark sides. This uh, story is called Other People by Neil Gaiman. Time is fluid here, said the demon. He knew it was a demon the moment he saw it. He knew it, just as he knew this place was hell. There was nothing else that either of them could have been. The room was long, and the demon waited by a smoking brazier at the far end. A multitude of objects hung on the rock gray walls of a kind that it would not have been wise or reassuring to inspect too closely. The ceiling was low, the floor oddly insubstantial. Come close, said the demon, and he did. The demon was rake thin and naked. It was deeply scarred, and it appeared to have been flayed at some time in the distant past. It had no ears, no sex. Its lips were thin and ascetic, and its eyes were a demon's eyes. They had seen too much and gone too far, and under their gaze he felt less important than a fly. What happens now? he asked. Now, said the demon, in a voice that carried with it no sorrow, no relish, only a dreadful flat resignation. You will be tortured. For how long? But the demon shook its head and made no reply. It walked slowly along the wall, eyeing first one of the devices that hung there, then another. At the far end of the wall by the closed door was a cat o' nine tails made of frayed wire. The demon took it down with one three-fingered hand and walked back, carrying it reverently. It placed the wire tines onto the brazier and stared at them as they began to heat up. That's inhuman. Yes. The tips of the cat's tails were glowing a dead orange. As the demon raised his arm to deliver the first blow, it said, in time, you will remember even this moment with fondness. You're a liar. No, said the demon. The next part, it explained in the moment before it brought down the cat, is worse. Then the tines of the cat landed on the man's back with a crack and a hiss, tearing through the expensive clothes, burning and rending and shredding as they struck, and not for the last time in the place he screamed. 
There were 211 implements on the walls of that room, and in time he was to experience each of them. When finally the Lazarine's daughter, which he had grown to know intimately, had been cleaned and replaced on the wall in the 211th position, then through wrecked lips he gasped, Now what? Now, said the demon, the true pain begins. It did. Everything he had ever done that had been better left undone. Every lie he had told, told to himself or told to others, every little hurt and all the great hurts, each one was pulled out of him detail by detail, inch by inch. The demon stripped away the cover of forgetfulness, stripped everything down to truth, and it hurt more than anything. Tell me what you thought as she walked out of the door, said the demon. I thought my heart was broken. No, said the demon without hate, you didn't. It stared at him with expressionless eyes, and he was forced to look away. I thought, now she'll never know I've been sleeping with her sister. The demon took apart his life, moment by moment, instant to awful instant. It lasted a hundred years, perhaps, or a thousand. They had all the time there ever was in that gray room. And toward the end, he realized that the demon had been right. The physical torture had been kinder. And it ended. And once it had ended, it began again. There was a self-knowledge there he had not had the first time, which somehow made everything worse. Now, as he spoke, he hated himself. There were no lies, no evasions, no room for anything except the pain and the anger. He spoke. He no longer wept. And when he finished a thousand years later, he prayed that now the demon would go to the wall and bring down the skinning knife or the choke pair or the screws. Again, said the demon. He began to scream. He screamed for a long time. Again, said the demon when he was done, as if nothing had been said. It was like peeling an onion. This time through his life, he learned about consequences. He learned the results of things he had done, things he had been blind to as he did them, the ways he had hurt the world, the damage he had done to people he had never known or met or encountered. It was the hardest lesson yet. Again, said the demon. A thousand years later. He crouched on the floor beside the brazier, rocking gently, his eyes closed, and he told the story of his life, re-experiencing it as he told it, from birth to death, changing nothing, leaving nothing out, facing everything. He opened his heart. When he was done, he sat there, eyes closed, waiting for the voice to say again. But nothing was said. He opened his eyes. Slowly, he stood up. He was alone. At the far end of the room, there was a door, and as he watched it, it opened. A man stepped through the door. There was terror in the man's face and arrogance and pride. The man who wore expensive clothes took several hesitant steps into the room and then stopped. When he saw the man, he understood. Time is fluid here, he told the new arrival. That's the end of the story. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate it. David will join us back in a minute here. I wanted to ask why you chose, you had a lot of stories to go through and just quickly say, not just these two, how did you choose out of 20? How did I choose out of 20? Um, I, I did choose somewhat by length, so there were less than 20 by the time I had controlled for length. <laughs> um, the, uh, the two finalists, this one, uh, as has happened several times today, gave me shivers. This one, you know, stood out at the end as, uh, though dark, I think there's some, some real truth in, you know, the self-knowledge freeing you. I, I actually find the, the idea of understanding the full weight of everything you've done and haven't done to be not only a dark idea, but also a beautiful one. Uh -huh. I, that was great. Um, there's a Keith Lawmer story. Uh, it's a very short one. Uh, if you haven't found it, go find it. All I will tell you is it's called test to destruction, the engineering term test to destruction. Uh, and it reminds me a lot of that in a different way, but I, that was good. Of course. Okay. It was Neil's, what can I say, you know, some of these references in the show, on our notes that we'll be releasing as a blog. Thank you again, Karen. Yeah. 